Loss is embedded in everything, and and acting on the value of love in the face of that loss is the key to, I think, spiritual health and well-being. You're listening to Dr. Matthew McKay on Psychologist Off the Clock. We are three clinical psychologists committed to cutting-edge, integrative, and evidence-based strategies for living well. On this podcast, we bring you ideas from psychology that can help you flourish in your work, parenting, relationships, and health. I am Dr. Diana Hill, practicing in Seaside, Santa Barbara, California. I'm Dr. Debbie Sorensen, practicing in Mile High, Denver, Colorado. And from coast to coast, I'm Dr. Yael Schoenbrunn, a Boston-based clinical psychologist and assistant professor at Brown University. We hope this podcast offers you ideas for how to live a full and meaningful life. Thank you for listening to Psychologists Off the Clock. This episode is about happiness and it's about some of the things that we think will make us happy that actually don't make us happy and what really does make us happy. And Dr. Matthew McKay, who's written a ton in the field of psychology and really is a sage and a wise, wise, wise uh, mentor in this area is going to share with us about the new happiness. And when I was thinking about, you know, introducing the episode, Debbie, I was curious if you, if you think about over the past week, what has made you really happy? There are a few moments that stood out for me. The first was a day that I went out in nature with my family on Father's Day. We were on a little hike and we also brought mountain bikes. Um, so we're kind of just enjoying family time together. I was watching one of my children actually mountain bike for the first time. And it was just so peaceful. It was so beautiful, beautiful day. And Colorado mountain biking, Colorado mountain and watching your child do mountain biking is scary and exhilarating. Yeah. Um, the second one was just, there was a day I had gotten up early in the morning and was trying to get a little work done with my coffee and lo and behold, my children also wake up early. And at first I was like, Oh no, there goes my productive morning. But then I just put the work aside and we snuggled on the couch and read a book together. And it was just Mm. so cozy and sweet to start the day that way. What were you Very reading? simple. We were reading Lulu Gets a Baby Sister. It's a chapter book for the Aww. Lulu series. Actually, it's Wait. the woman who, yeah, who wrote Alexander and the Terrible, Horrible, oh. No Good, Very Bad Day, who has an yes. article about happiness. Yeah. We should, I will link that article that she wrote about happiness. She's 90 years old She's now? 90 years old. And she is so wise around what, what has brought her happiness in her life. I'll link to that because I, I sent, I sent it out to our little psychologist group that we love. So wow. uh, I think. It's a must read. It's yeah. a must read. And the book itself has a character who's pretty um, difficult. And so yeah. it kind of shows that happiness is not always sort of being sweet and joyful. Awesome. Yeah. So that was a cozy moment. And then I also, honestly, you know, I have good days and bad days at work, like most people, but I genuinely find my work meaningful. And I had a really good day at work this week. And so I just had a day where I felt happy at work for a good chunk of the day. And so that was another moment, just one of those days where you actually feel like you're good at your job and, and you're enjoying it, which mm. isn't always what was, like- it? what was it about it that made you happy? Like, can you point to, I think it was the interactions that I was having with clients and with yeah. my, you know, my coworkers and trainees. I think that there's days that it just feels really good to be engaged in that. Yeah. Feeling connected. How good. about you? What, what happened over your week, Diana? I was just thinking about that this morning. I had a chance to sleep in, which we've been doing the 5 a.m. for a lot for a number of days in a row here. It's been a busy week. And this morning we slept in. And um, when I woke up, my husband reached over and just put his hand on my hand. And there was this moment of just, wow, I can just savor this. So that was, that made me so happy of just having that time. And uh, another moment was sort of a more of a bigger thing was that we just, I finished an event with um, my good friend, Kristen Rusky up at the coffee farm yesterday. And at the end of the event, we do this, uh, this goodbye greeting from New Zealand called Hong Yi. And what you do is you place one hand in the other person's hand, and then you place the other hand on the shoulder of the other person, and then you touch noses. And there was this moment when we just touched noses and we looked at each other and we were like, we did it. 
we pulled it off. <laughs> That's so sweet. Having that, that partnership of having done something really hard with someone that you care about, a good friend, and feeling that, um, that connection. And then the last, the last one was more just um, myself. I, I, it's been really foggy here in Santa Barbara. June gloom, they call it. And this morning I was sitting down in my little meditation space and I could hear the fog collecting and making these little droplets and then landing from, from the roof down to the ground. And the sound of that little droplet just was really peaceful and connected me to nature. So, these, you know, yeah. I noticed a lot of our moments, both of ours were just these kind of little simple daily moments. Absolutely. And that's what I think a lot of the happiness research points to is that not only daily moments, but also relationships. So some correlational findings around people that are the happiest, what are they doing? And this comes from the Greater Good Science Center. One is that they have stable and fulfilling relationships. Second, they're, they experience a lot of gratitude and they express gratitude they're also in places of service and helping others. So that experience, you know, even of reading a book to your kid or, or experiences at work or kind of service experiences, you know, you're, you're thinking about the other person, not just yourself. Uh, happy people tend to also live in the present and savor the pleasures in life. They tend to have physical activity as a habit. They are connected with spirituality or religion, and they have significant, meaningful life goals. So I think all those things together, I think there's little bits of reflection of those in our experiences of happiness this week too, Debbie. Yeah, I think so too. So enjoy this episode, savor it uh, with Dr. Matthew McKay. Dr. Matthew McKay is a professor at the Wright Institute, where he teaches classes on CBT, DBT, and ACT. He's also the director of the Berkeley CBT Clinic and co-director with Robin Walser of the Bay Area Trauma Recovery Clinic, which is a low-fee community clinic exclusively treating PTSD. Dr. McKay co-founded Haight-Ashbury Psych Services, which is a low-fee community clinic 40 years ago and was the clinical director for over for 25 years. He also co-founded New Harbinger Publications, and we've had a number of authors of New Harbinger books on this show, when he's currently a publisher for New Harbinger. He has co-developed protocols, including ACT for Interpersonal Disorders, ACT for Couples, ACT for Anger Problems, Emotion Efficacy Therapy. We had Aprilia West on the show uh, recently about that, ACT for Spiritual Growth, Mind and Emotions. And he's author of numerous books, including Thoughts and Feelings, Self-Esteem, the DBT uh, skills workbook, the relaxation and stress reduction workbook, the anger control workbook. And today we're going to talk about his most recent uh, work, which is the new happiness. Welcome, Dr. McKay. It's such a treat to have you on the show. Glad to be with you. You have such a rich history in the field of psychology and have dedicated much of your life to both serving underserved populations, but also disseminating this work to uh, to the general public in the realm of self-help, um, as well as to therapists and training therapists. I think I'd like to maybe just start with this new happiness and for you to start with talking about what is the old happiness and maybe, and then maybe what you see is the, the new happiness. I think we've been really confused about happiness for a long time uh, as, a, as a culture and, and as a prof- profession, actually. Um, you know, we, we think of happiness as, as joy, uh, this sudden sense of being in the flow and, uh, and, and pleasure. And yet these are temporary experiences. There's no way you can hold on to joy or pleasure as, as mammals. We habituate and uh, we tend to go back to baseline. So joy and pleasure are really not the source of happiness. Uh, we think of happiness as good circumstances, of having the things that you want, uh, having your needs met. Uh, may, maybe even uh, in, uh, in Maslow's hierarchy being, you know, fulfill, completely fulfilled on some level. But that happiness uh, actually is transient, temporary, because things keep happening to us. Uh, we keep in, facing pain in our lives. Uh, and, uh, in fact, we can't hold on to excellent circumstances. So the new happiness is acknowledging that... Um, circumstances can change at any time and that at any moment we can face pain and yet we can still 
have happiness. We can still retain a sense of happiness. And the new happiness is living our life in uh, ali uh, alignment with what really matters to us, with our core values. And that can never be taken from us. There is no circumstance that can take that sense of what I care about and my values away from me. As long as I'm acting on my values, no matter what happens to me, I can experience that deep sense of contentment, that new happiness. Mm. And one of the things that you also write about in the new happiness is the concept of spirituality, which has been a little bit, I think, off limits in the field of psychology or at least evidence-based psychology. Spirituality um, can be kind of categorized of, as sort of religion or that's out there. And I think when Marsha Linehan came in as a major player in psychology with bringing some of the concepts from Zen, her own practice of Zen and contemplative prayer, she started to break some of that, um, that lineup. And she also, the reason why she was able to do that is because she had evidence that it worked and her, her treatment worked uh, in a data driven way. But can you talk a little bit about what you mean by spirituality and its role in happiness? Well, I think, you know, you're, you're right that in terms of, um, the third wave of behavior therapy <clears throat> and mindfulness is sort of the foundation of that. But the people that built the third wave uh, tried to use mindfulness stripped of spirituality. Yeah. Uh, they were afraid of it. Uh, uh, MBSR really d built strongly on mindfulness. Almost no uh, uh, nod to any spiritual values. Uh, and the same was true of ACT and so forth. So uh, what's, we try to secularize mm -hmm. uh, mindfulness. Um, but spirituality is deeper than mindfulness. Spirituality is accessing our sense of connection to all and, and being aware. And whether, you, whether your spirituality leads to a belief in God or the divine is, is less important than the sense of connectedness that we all are somehow belong together. And, um, and that the, the source of that spirituality, I think, is, is, is in listening to our own inner wisdom, our, our own sense of truth. Uh, and we access it through mindfulness, but we discover it in ourselves. And so that's one of the things that we talk about in The New Happiness, that, is that spirituality uh, is a discovery of our connection and our belonging. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're right that spirituality is a, is a doing, not a believing, which I really appreciated that line. It's a doing. So what do you mean by that, a doing? Right. So the experience of belonging requires action. Uh, if, if, we're, if, if we belong to all, we have to uh, find a way to act on that truth. And, um, and, and, and so action is... Um, a necessary is far more important than cosmologies than belief systems. Uh, am I am I acting in alliance in alignment with my spirituality, uh, with my sense of of connectedness, uh, with my sense of belonging, uh, and and the way we get to that is is through values, which is a classic act uh, uh, vehicle. But in the new happiness, we, we look at two different kinds of values. We look at service values, the values of, 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 of how we connect outside of ourselves, how we connect to others, to other entities, to the universe itself. Uh, what, are the, what are those values? And then we also look at uh, self-growth values, uh, values that have to do with our own development uh, and enhancement as, as human beings, as souls. Um, and so both of these are necessary, I think, in order to experience that deep sense of connection and spirituality that we're, we're trying to help people find through the new happiness. Mm -hmm. And some of the, the things that you look at in that book are these, these moments of choice where we're, where we're, we're pausing in the moment and deciding, is this, is this in line with my spiritual values or is this out of line with my spiritual values? And actually the practice, I worked through the workbook myself uh, when I, I like to do it on me. <laughs> Might as well do it on me because I'm going to benefit from it. 
And I liked the, I liked the, the moment of choice, but actually what I really liked that had the bigger in, impact on me was the missed moment. Mm-hmm. Because when I worked through that, it actually brought up, and, and I think you write about this, like missed moments are moments where you feel this twinge of pain and you feel this loss. And um, I wonder if you can talk about the missed moment of choice. And I wouldn't mind sharing my, you know, my personal experience with that, but I think uh, learning uh, learning how to recognize the moment of choice depends on, on starting with an intention. I, I personally start every morning with with a, an intention of, of how I want to uh, behave that day, uh, how I want to bring my important values into action that day, and I may you know look forward in the day and see certain moments where I can actually uh, uh, bring those values to life, and um, but. But learning to recognize the moment of choice is not just planning in advance. It's looking backwards and seeing what happened when some when we blew past those moments. Uh, and, and and first of all, just noticing there was a moment there, and I I didn't I didn't seize it. I didn't I didn't either. I didn't recognize it, or I cho- chose to act on uh, emotion driven behaviors, for example. Yeah. Uh, and just and so looking backwards and saying, okay, well, where what was that moment? What was going on? What was I thinking and feeling? What were my action urges? Um, but what was the value that I could have enacted in that moment? And my, what might have been the outcome uh, different from what actually happened uh, had I acted on that value? So, so looking, uh, looking back on those missed moments and, and actually working through what happened, why it happened, uh, what could have happened uh, based on my guys, I think is a very important part of learning to capture that moment when it occurs. Mm -hmm, Absolutely. And for me, it was um, just what I was, when I was doing the work, but it was just that day, uh, there was this moment where my son had come up to me. I have a six-year-old and he came up to me and wanted to uh, play a game, like a board game with me. And I was busy making dinner. And then I had some work phone calls and I said, later, I can't do it right now. And the nature of a six-year-old is that when I went back to him later, he was onto something else. He's like, no, mom, I don't really want to play a game with you anymore. And I had this sinking feeling of, of losing that. What was interesting is this morning when I, I was getting ready to see some clients and I knew I was going to do an interview with you, my six-year-old came up and asked me this morning in the busyness of it all, will you play a game? And I said, yes. And it felt so good to say yes to that moment of choice, but I wouldn't have not- noticed it if I wasn't doing this type of work. And I think there is, like you said, intention setting. It's such an important part of this process, as well as being willing to step into pain, a little bit of pain. So can you talk maybe a bit about that, of how, how pain actually can help us with our, our spiritual values? I think that's, uh, that is important. Um, there are things that we need to learn to, to notice that, that are indicators or flags that a moment of choice is at hand. Mm-hmm. and. Um, one of those things is uh, desire. If you have a very strong desire for something, uh, you're hungry for something, you're, you're, dr- you're driven towards something, well, that's a sign that there's a moment of choice. You have to t- actually, can you pause? Can you take a look? Is, do I w- really want to um, act on, on this urge, on this desire? Um, another place where we have to be very conscious is when emotional pain shows up. Uh, any kind of emotional pain is usually an indication that there's going to be a moment of choice because we're going to be um, driven toward what our emotions demand of us, emotion-driven behavior, uh, traditional ways of coping with pain, avoidance, uh, or we could consider what our values would lead us to do uh, in this moment. And for example, in, in this uh, therapy, we developed some, some years ago act for interpersonal problems uh, one of the things we look at is how uh, in, in every interpersonal situation, uh, when pain shows up, that choice is automatically there because we're, we're going we're to be launching into avoidance, into, into emotion-driven behaviors, the, the things that usually destroy relationships, that undermine them, uh, that disconnect us from others, uh, or we're going to look at the possibility that there's a value here that could inform what we do. Uh, that we could act on and actually change the direction, the vector of this moment, this interpersonal moment. 
Um, and so having that awareness is like, it's, it's just so crucial, uh, both in terms of changing how our relationships feel, how we, how we act in our relationships, but also how, how we respond to virtually every situation in our lives where pain shows up. Another component that you work on or to help cultivate uh, spiritual values is using meditation. And you do traditional mindfulness meditation in the book, but you also do some meditations that help people access a wise, you know, sort of inner, inner self. Can you talk a bit about that? Yeah. So as we call it deep knowledge meditations. Um, and uh, some of it is, is really no different from classic wise mind that uh, you would, you know, do it in DBT, for example. Um, but we're also uh, using a, 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 a process where people can go and can, can access not only their own wisdom, but they can actually connect uh, outside of themselves. So we're, we're encouraging people to consider the possibility that they can uh, acquire wisdom from uh, their higher self, uh, their soul self, if you want to put it that way, um, from those who loved ones who've passed over from guides uh, from the divine itself. Uh, they can, and so they can, they can, they can send the request essentially like you send mail. It's a, it's addressed somewhere. And, uh, and I believe that, that we, uh, that people can get information back, uh, uh, again, from their higher self, from guides, from souls on the other side, from the divine, from all of consciousness, we can get information back when we seek it. And so we're encouraging people to, uh, it's essentially what prayer does. It's, 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 it's opening a channel uh, outside of ourselves to, to wisdom that uh, all of consciousness holds. Uh, and, and we suggest that that can be done. It's not necessary uh, to do the exercises and and we can just limit it to our own wise mind and not uh, and not you know extend it outside to other consciousness. Uh, but I think by being willing to extend it, if if people feel comfortable with that, they can get uh, wisdom and, and data that may not be accessible in their own awareness. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And maybe a, a a more open, different perspective than they could just generate on their own when they're trying to work through a, you know, a tangled problem that an, an offering of something unexpected, a more um, creative, a creative solution. Yeah. yeah well, when I do deep knowledge meditation, I get very surprised yeah. by things that come back to me and they don't, and, and they, they often feel like it's not exactly mine, that this is something that's been given to me. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and that sense of surprise and, and wonder, uh, at these messages kind of confirms for me their authenticity, that there is something that I'm, I'm getting. I'm, I'm, I'm a receiver for something uh, that can be very valuable at difficult moments when I really don't know what to do. Mm-hmm. You work a lot with trauma and it seems like that, that would be very helpful for people that have experienced trauma or experiencing the effects of trauma. We did a little, uh, you know, just following that up. I mean, we did a little study with the New Happiness Protocol, which is a, a you know, it's kind of a, it's a ten week protocol, and actually, uh, people are using. We use it in our trauma uh, clinic, and um, and also at the Berkeley CBT clinic. And what we found was, to our surprise, uh, that uh, tr- uh, trauma scores, say in, in this case on the MPSS. Uh, improved uh, the large effect size, 0.97. Whoa. Uh, effect size. And, and just a 10-week uh, pre and post, uh, we saw extremely surprising uh, changes, changes that actually were larger than our individual therapy effect sizes. So um, encouraging people to uh, identify their values, act on their values, and 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 go deeper into their spirituality uh, apparently impacts trauma in ways that we actually hadn't expected. Mm -hmm. And what's interesting in the field of psychology is that for some reason that's been okay in the domain of addictions. Like we're allowed to do that in the domain of addictions. Yeah. You can have a higher power in the 12 steps. You can make amends. You can do all this. 
uh, you can say I'm powerless over this. But as soon as we step out of the domain of addictions and we move into things like trauma or depression, it's like, oh, we can't, we can't touch spirituality or talk about that. And, that oh, yeah. Go ahead. Well, I think that has to do with this idea that spirituality is based on beliefs. And yeah. as psychologists, we're very, very loath to sell our cosmologies and belief right. systems to clients. It feels, it feels intrusive, invasive even, uh, and, and, and maybe unethical uh, to do that. And, um, and so is, if, if, you're, if you're thinking that, that helping people strengthen their spirituality requires uh, getting them to buy into a particular belief system, even if it's, even if it's Buddhism, for example, mm-hmm. which is, you know, a pretty commonly held belief system among psychologists, uh, we're loath to do that. But if you define spirituality as acting on your spiritual values and accessing your connection to all without defining what that all is, uh, and, and that you don't have to believe anything, what you have to do is find out what is spiritually important to you, what you really care about, and, and, and the spiritual values that animate your life, and, and build intentions to, to all throughout the day act on those. That's what you need to build yeah. your spirituality, not a belief system. Yeah. And as Steve Hayes has often described values being like favorite colors, where yours may be blue and mine may be green. As a therapist, I'm not saying green is better than blue. I'm just saying, what's your favorite color? Like, tell me about it. And we can explore that and that not, not put some, um, yeah, like not put some belief in there. That's absolutely right. But we did put our fingers on the scale in a way that I, I think that ACT has not always been comfortable with by, yes. uh, by differentiating between um, service values and self-growth values. Mm-hmm. Uh, I remember when we, when we wrote the book, uh, Georg Eifert and uh, John Forsyth and I uh, wrote a book um, on, on values, um, you know, your life on purpose. And, and we were really struggling with that because um, uh, Gerard was saying, well, you know, uh, I don't want to, you know, elevate service values that, that, that's, you know, that's not, uh, you know, none of those values are any more important than the self enhancement values. And we kind of went around and around about it and we didn't end up saying one set of values is more important than the other. But personally, I believe that service values are necessary. You can't just have self growth values. You, you need service values because that's what connects you outside yourself. Uh, and, and those are, I, I think, irreplaceable. They, you have to, and that's why we ask people to look for those values mm-hmm. uh, because that's part of the sense of connectedness and belonging that, uh, spirituality creates. Mm -hmm. And that's what the, also the compassion focused therapy folks are looking at, not just compassion for self, but the flow of compassion towards others and how that actually, that also generates happiness. So there's this happiness pie chart that researcher Sonia Leibnerski has written about that attributes 50% of our happiness to our genetics, what we're born with. And only 10% to life circumstances, the things that we spend actually a lot of time and energy trying to change. Uh, But 40% is really under our control. And some of that 40% is things like spirituality and um, social connection. And those are some things that um, I'm really glad that you write about in the book, because most of the time we're thinking about happiness, we're focusing more on the things that we try and get. And it doesn't connect us. It doesn't, it doesn't move us outside of ourselves. So yeah, I think both things are very, very important. Which links to you, because that's what you've done a lot in your life. I was so interested to read how you've created these community clinics, serving people that probably can't get services elsewhere. And here's somebody that's extremely experienced and, you know, an expert in the field, written all these books, and you're serving the underserved populations. And I appreciate that. But can you talk about your own, your own values and how it drive how they drive the work that you've done in the trajectory you've taken in your life? You know, I think in some ways it's very simple for me. I, I, um, I need to be of service. And if I'm not, I start to get depressed. Mm-hmm. I actually feel a sense of ennui of, of, of something is wrong. Um, 
And it's almost like I don't have a choice about it. Um, if, I, if I'm not spending a good bit of my time in a way that I think, you know, is a benefit to other people, I'm, I'm just not going to feel very good. I'm not going to feel very happy. I'm almost compelled. So I, I don't take any credit for it. I'm just sort of I, I'm some, somehow constructed to need to be that and do that. Um, but it's probably driven me over the years. So mo- most of the choices I've made in my career have been, will this, will this be of help? Will this, you know, at, at, at the publishing company, I mean, the whole question was, are these books going to help somebody? Will they help people change their lives? And if they're not, and I'm not interested in publishing them. I'm not interested in the money. I just, I just want to know that, that, that human beings are getting um, tools mm-hmm. to make a difference in their lives. So, I mean, it's, it, and again, it's not something I chose or, or even um, uh, set out to do. It just turned out to be, that's how I have to live. Mm-hmm. Your, your publishing company, uh, New Harbinger, for those, you know, I'm sure psychologists, therapists out there have heard of New Harbinger. For those that aren't in that um, in the field, you know, New Harbinger makes, it, it bridges all of the science and the, you know, the research out there and brings it to people and, and offers um, books and self-help, books for therapists to learn different therapies. And when I, so my mom's a gardener and I remember being a kid when ever this seed catalog would come home, my mom would get all excited and she'd sit on the couch with the seed catalog and her red pen and her cup of tea. And she'd go through it because there was so much potential of this seed for this summer. And I could order this. And I, and I find myself doing the same thing with the new Harbinger catalog. (laughs) I bring it home, get my cup of tea and I read through it. Like there's so much potential in, in these offerings and it's, um, I think that's another way of, of being of service is, is offering, you know, all these authors their, their wisdom and opportunity to have a voice and share it with, with us. So I also appreciate yeah. that. Well, our, our mission has been trying to help therapists find evidence-based ways of making their clients' lives better. I mean, it, it's just, I, you know, you know, when I was learning so I graduate, I was in graduate school and, and learning psychotherapy, psychodynamic therapies were still, you know, tremendous, you know, tremendously influential. And, um, and it just, it was just very disturbing to me to see these therapies being practiced that had no, no uh, evidence base, no, no actual utility, people wasting years of their lives, um, uh, uh, and money uh, visiting a therapist that produced no effects. And it's just, uh, so it became like a, a passion of mine to, to try to provide, if I could, the, the knowledge to therapists, the knowledge I needed mm-hmm. to be effective. Um, and so that's really guided us in terms of everything we've published. And, so, and, so, and sometimes we have, I have the experience when we're, we have meetings every week where we decide what you know, the next books we're going to publish. And I'm hearing a, a book presented. I'm going. I've got to read that book. I, I need to yeah. know that. You know, I've got a client that I could really use that book with. You know, and I, I'm getting excited. Uh, and it's it's just it was the mission we started with uh, is to make these make books not only the, to serve uh, individuals who buy them in a bookstore, but to serve therapists who need evidence based tools. Mm-hmm. And on, on a related note, I'm I'm curious about you in have in providing the service and working at these clinics. Um, just the impact of working with populations like you have of giving. And I was actually doing a training uh, um, a couple of weeks ago at a local community neighborhood clinic. The, the therapists are seeing eight clients a day. Um, and really challenging clients with medical, you know, co-occurring situations and. And one of the things that I ended up intentionally doing in that training, which is the whole nice thing about ACT, was I did a whole matrix around self-care just because I knew the therapist needed it, honestly. Uh, and, and then knowing that if they did it on themselves and they could maybe, you know, it would be modeled for how they'd work with their clients. But I'm curious about in your work at the clinic, how, how you practice your own self-care and then also how you support the therapists that work there that are doing um, this important work. 
Well, it's actually your the issue of self care is huge. I mean, I've I've kind of specialized in treating trauma over the years. It's just sort of a, it's my passion, uh, and and over the years I've absorbed a lot of pain from clients. I listen to stories that won't go away, images that won't go away, um, and varieties of human suffering that amaze me that people can survive. So I really have, um, and, and in our clinic, we have students uh, learning trauma treatments and getting the same, having the same experience of being, you know, overwhelmed by what they hear and the images that form of what they hear. So, I mean, we do, I mean, I, I do a lot of work with our, with our students um, in the clinic about uh, using mindfulness to um, not to not to lose contact with the pain, but using mindfulness to remember that I live in this body, in in in, in this in, in in this experience, and that this human being who's in so much pain lives in that body and that experience. But but to but to acknowledge that we we are living in different places. I I can experience some of what they experience. I need to experience some of what some of their pain in order to help them. But I also have to have to feel my separateness. That means feeling my breath, feeling myself in the chair, feeling the awareness of my own history and my own life and the vector of my life and knowing that that's different than this other human being across from me. So we spent a lot of time really learning to, to ground in, 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 the, in this body and in the, this present moment that I live in as opposed to this, this person who is telling me their story, their pain. What about when the pain is your own? You've experienced a pretty significant loss in your life. And I know you've written quite a bit about it and talked about it. So I hope it's okay that I bring this up on the, yeah. on the conversation. Um, but your son, Jordan, that you lost, it sounds like about a decade ago, um, who was killed. And I'm, I'm wondering how, how you navigated that for yourself and, um, and its impact on you and your life now. It's such a a complex answer that sort of needed to hear. But I, mm -hmm. I mean, I mean, on one level, you know, it sort of it shifted who I was seeing. I was I saw you know I used to see a lot of trauma, but mm -hmm. then I started seeing people who were traumatized by losses, usually of their children. They they would come to me because they had read about. Uh, I read a book about uh, Jordan, and um, I, uh, I mean, the, the experience of having people tell me about their children losing their children has been hard. It, it's, it's very. It, sometimes it's just it just rocks me, uh, and uh, and yet it's it seems like I have something to give them, and they need something that maybe I have to offer that might not another therapist might not be able to give them and so i'm willing to do it um i i i think what makes it possible is i actually experience jordan as as still existing i experience him as involved in my life i found ways of communicating with him I use automatic writing it's usually not something i talk about professionally but i i do it i I feel um, his presence and his engagement and his love, and so and so. Even though I've lost the, my boy as, as a, physically, I feel his his presence remains, and so that helps me in the face of the pain of working with people who've lost their their children. Uh, is that I I feel him with me, um, and and some and. To the extent that people are willing to go there, I'm I'm more than happy to teach methods through which I've connected to him, and that they can connect to their loved one. Um, and I'm, obviously, I'm going far beyond psychotherapy in in, in 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 that. But I'm, but I think people can they can connect to the other side, and and it's actually not that hard to learn. So um, those are some of the places that I've gone, and some of the ways that things have changed for me. But but, I, but what the biggest thing that changed for me was losing the meaning, learning that death is not the end of a relationship. 
And, uh, and I do try to convey that to people who come to me having lost a child. Uh, death is not the end of that relationship. Uh, and that relationship can be held and maintained and that love can be conveyed back and forth regardless of the fact that that child is not physically present. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. Which leads to two concepts that you also talk about in the new happiness, impermanence and grace. Can you talk about those? Yeah. Well, impermanence, you know, obviously is, is a Buddhist concept that, um, that suggests that, you know, everything changes, everything breaks down, things erode, uh, things are lost, things, even things that we count on, even things that we think we ought to be able to keep, you know, as, you know no parent expects to lose a child. We, we expect our children to outlive us. Uh, and yet, and yet we do lose the things that we value most, care about the most. And so in the face of impermanence, how can we live? I think that's the question. And, and so if the idea is that we've got to hold on to everything, and since we, we keep losing things, including our own physical capacities, our mental capacities, our health, uh, and ultimately our own lives, I mean, everything ultimately is lost. Mm-hmm. Uh, how, how, how do we stay sane in the, in the face of that? And the answer is not to try to fight the truth of that. Uh, you know, from an act point of view, we have to accept uh, the truth that things can be lost, will be lost. Relationships change. Our bodies change. Everything changes. Um, and so what we're encouraging people to do in the face of those changes um, is to continue to act on love, essentially. You know, really, all of all of our values uh, really reduce to love. Uh, every single value reduces to love, whether it's service values or loving, loving others, loving, loving the world, loving, loving uh, what exists, or or self love in terms of the values that we have for our own self growth and enhancement. Everything that we do that authentically grows from values is really about love. And so the question is, how can you love in the face of change, in the face of loss, um, uh, in the face of impermanence? And, and I think the answer is you, you do it with intention. You, 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 you love with intention, knowing that, that loss is inevitably part of every relationship of every experience it may not lose the relationship itself but you lose some vitality you lose uh, some some connection you loss is embedded in everything and mm-hmm. and acting on the value of love in the face of that loss is mm-hmm. the key to i think spiritual health and well-being yeah francis weller uh talks about the five gates of grief i don't know if you've heard these but the first gate is Everything that we love, we will lose. And then uh, the second gate has to do with the parts of ourselves that haven't known love, grieving that, the loss of that. Maybe it's a part of ourselves that was never loved by a parent or by a partner. And then there's a gate, which is um, the gate of the things that we thought we thought that we would have in our life that we don't have. You know, a child that would grow to an old age or, you know, a partnership that we don't have anymore. And then another gate of, um, of loss and grief is the sorrows of the world that, you know, the feeling that all of it exists right now. Um, and then another one is our ancestral grief that we come into this world with a history, you know, whether if you have a Jewish background, the grief around that, or if you're a person of color and your ancestry and how they've been harmed or enslaved. And all of that is, it's so, it's so painful, but love is, love is the, like how to actually approach and be in the grief and loss of just being human, yeah. but approaching it with love. Yeah. That's, that's beautiful. I actually wasn't familiar with that. Um, yeah. That, I mean, I think one thing I'm saying is that you, you can love another human being, another soul, even though they're physically gone, yeah. even though they're not here on this 
this mm-hmm. plane. Uh, and, 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 and we let, we do this all the time. And, and, you know, we, you know, we, if in a romantic relationship, you you fall in love. There's a, there's a, there's a huge physical component to it. There's this, this sense of, 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 of this sort of idealizing this other person. Uh, and we get old and we're not that physical person anymore that, that was so attractive in the beginning. And we have, uh, and we change emotionally and we, and, 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 and we, sh- we evolve, uh, and, 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 and holding on to love, even though this is a person who's physically different, this person has changed enormously in terms of how they are in the world. All of that has changed. They may even have changed into the way they relate to us. All of that, and yet we can still choose to love them. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, in the face of all that change, and that is to me the, uh, the and 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 all and not, not just the changes, but the, the pain. You know, they've hurt us in different ways. There have been moments of rejection, um, uh, moments of yearning for something that we never got. Um, and in the face of all of that, in the face of the change and also the, the, the loss and the, and, the, and, the, and the pain itself, the emotional pain that's inherent in every relationship, how can we continue to love? And that, to me, is, is the central question of life. So I guess I have one, one more question for you, which is, um, and thinking about the next stage of your um, of your life and your impact in the field of psychology, where do you in, where would you like it to go? Where do you envision? What's your intention for well, your future? <laughs> well, I'm pretty clear. I think about what I want to be doing. I um, I'm really interested in doing some research on trauma. Uh, continuing to you know grow our trauma clinic, uh, but also to do some research on um, on how uh, it, how to treat trauma, uh, the reconsolidation of memory, all of, all of this fascinating new stuff that's coming out about how t- trauma is retained in memory and how it can can be literally changed while, while memories mm-hmm. are plastic. Yeah, we're starting to do the research on that at our clinic, and I'm like so excited about. It you know, using techniques to deliberately increase the plasticity of memory so it can be changed and altered. Um, so that just excites the hell out of me. And um, also, you know, process-based CBT. I mean, for a long time, I've been, you know, I've been working toward uh, in my own research. We developed a, a, a measure a conference, a coping inventory that's, that's, that's um, built onto a, a, uh, a transdiagnostic a system of transdiagnostic assessment system, um, and uh, kind of getting to a point where we have pretty twelve pretty reliable uh, mechanisms that uh, that we, we use in our clinics. Both of our clinics, we we we, we treat the mechanisms, not the diagnoses, uh, and 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 I want to really you know, codify and develop a clear set of treatments for each of the major mechanisms that I think cause uh, psychological pain. And I'll probably end up doing a process-based CBT workbook, uh, mm-hmm. using it, but also incorporating positive psychology, not just, not just fixing stuff that's, that's hurting, uh, not just deficits, functional deficits, but also, um, how can we, how can we enhance, enhance, uh, positive um, skills and um, strengths. So uh, I'm kind of probably going to start tackling that next year. I'm kind of excited about it. You're not slowing down by any means. You're gearing up for the next, the next round. And for those that are interested in process-based CBT, we had Steve Hayes on talking about that, uh, which was a great uh, interview with him. It's such an honor to have him on uh, as well. And I, I, I believe you're involved in his upcoming book, uh, as well in some way or another. I don't know. Um, but, uh, so that all sounds, sounds great. And I'm, I'm glad that you're at the forefront of some of those big changes, both in trauma, but also in, in how we're treating, um, treating people, not putting them in boxes anymore. Yeah, the key thing is we got to throw away the, uh, DSM. Yeah. And start treating the real causes of, of psychological problems, not, not, yeah. you know, but back baskets of, of symptoms. 
Yeah, yeah. We'll recycle it. <laughs> Value spaced. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Dr. McKay. It's just a really uh, wonderful and honor to have you on. And it was really moving to to hear your story and, and your um and your book as well. And for those that are interested in, in the new happiness and your other books, we'll definitely link you up uh, on our website so people can click on those and get signed up for a new Harbinger catalog. It just sort of is a feel good experience <laughs> when it comes in the meal <laughs> of so much potential. So thank you very much you for your offering. Really okay. okay. Take care. Thank you for listening to Psychologist Off the Clock. You can find us on iTunes, Facebook, and Twitter. This podcast is for informational and entertainment purposes only and is not meant to be a substitute for mental health treatment. If you are having a mental health emergency, please dial 911. If you're looking for mental health treatment, please visit the resources on our webpage. Our website is www.offtheclockpsych.com. That's www.offtheclockpsych.com.